Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Tuned and Strong podcast. I am Angela McHuston of Music Strong, joined by my lovely co-host. I am Dr. Jen Cabas may of Tuned and Toned Performance, also already messing up my autofocus, so that's fun. <laughs> It's real life. It's real life. And today we have a really special guest. Uh, we are joined by Vinny, and I am going to mess up your name. I think it's Shulshevsky. Am I right? Perfect. Ha! Nailed it. Okay. <laughs> Better than hashtag, you know, nailed it, Pinterest. So, <laughs> Vinny, by, Vinny Shulshevsky, who has quite the interesting story. And we would just love for you to introduce yourself and to tell us your story. Like, what do you play? How did you get into music? What does fitness mean? I mean, there's so many uh, avenues we can go down with this. So tell us about yourself. Uh, I'm Vinny Shoshelsky. I'm, I'm uh, here in the middle Tennessee area, Nashville, Tennessee. I've been here since uh, 1992. Uh, prior to that, uh, mostly in Maryland, Florida. Um, started playing trumpet when I was nine years old. Um, I was a fat kid and I joined a drum and boogie course, so they put me on bass drum. And I was marching around a pool table with the bass drum, you know, because I was I was big enough to, to hold it. It was a gigantic thing, and uh, the 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 core director Bob Spears grabbed me uh, by the scruff one night and said, "Hey, stick your head in here and see what this looks like." And I took home like a Boy Scout bugle, like a straight F, no valves, no nothing. Cornet kind of thing. Yeah, and and my dad, who had played trumpet when he was a kid, taught me how to play taps and reveille. And in about a week. He went out to my mom and he said, the kid's already better than me. We need to get up some trumpet lessons. And that was the beginning of the downward spiral of my career. Uh, that was the highlight right there. I'm learning taps from my dad. And, you know, so. Um, you peaked you know, at 10. There we go. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I, I peaked at nine and now I'm uh, 58. So uh, in high school, you know, I played uh, several sports. None very well. None very well. Uh, but I was a heavier kid, and, and around 10th grade, um, I started playing football and didn't change anything else except for running around this gigantic hill that they had like a mile away. I had no idea what the, what the uh, correlation was, but I, I dropped about 50 pounds. And, and a little cheerleader, wow. who was also a flute player, uh, took a shine into me, and I thought, wow, I, I kind of I like this. And so, you know motivation i guess you find it where you will <laughs> <laughs> and we made beautiful music together actually we're still friends to this day um went to college and uh you know i didn't really pick up the freshman 15 i kind of picked up the freshman 50 or 60 and I, i've just struggled with with that my whole life uh meanwhile my, my music career is going on and, and moving through and, and when i was in college again i started running um three miles every other day and I would swim on the off days a mile. And so I went from like complete couch potato, like drinking my face off and eating whole pizzas to like, it's just one extreme to the other. And again, dumped a bunch of weight. So it's just this, it's like, a, I really should be the poster child for Dunkin' Yo-Yo's uh, because <laughs> until, uh, and, uh, fast forward, you know, through Nashville, um, my career started out in Nashville just awesome and I've been so fortunate to uh I got here in 92 and so far it's uh 2000 it's 2021 I've uh, appeared on over 6,000 recordings uh nice. a, a bunch of Grammys and you know and all that kind of stuff just just career highlight like things that I would have never dreamed of in high school um but I I struggled when I first got here because I was at my heaviest uh, in June of 1999, I went to the doctor. I was feeling kind of weird, you know, and, and uh, he weighed me. I weighed 313 pounds. And, and, and he said, stood above me. I was sitting in one of the little chairs and he stood above me. And he said, Vinny, you're fat and you're going to die soon. Wow. And wow. I, said, I said, come on, man, give me a break. He's like, no, I'm not kidding. You have a, you have a uh, irregular, you took a cardiogram. You have an irregularity in your heart. Um, you, you're just, you're, you're too big. You got to lose 60 pounds pretty quick. And then another 40 after that, um, to, to really, if you want to see your son graduate from high school, if you want to see him get married and have kids and all that kind of stuff. And I, and that was it for me, man. That was it. Um, meanwhile, I'm still playing. I was out on tour with, um, with a girl named Winona Judd. You may have heard of her. Um, 
They were my idols as a kid. Hey, um, mom, dude, I, listen, I ran into her mom a year before I got the gig. I ran into her mom at an airport. I was with the kids and she brought a whoopee cushion over to me and said, I see you with your kids. I can see you're having a good time. I think this will add to your joy. <laughs> hey, I'll be and I, man, I blew it up and those kids were putting it under everybody in the whole airport, man. And, and uh, she twirled away. And, and, and I told her at the time, I said, I don't know your daughter. And she doesn't know this yet, but I'm going to play trumpet with her one day. And a year later, man, it was like I was a, a wizard. Uh, I wish I could That's do that. With like, I'm going to win the lottery. Okay. <laughs> I'll make sure to pay off your mortgages. Um, <laughs> so I was with Winona and there was this guitar tech um, on stage left. And he was like, he looked like Tarzan. He was a beautiful human being and he was a rigger too. So he would climb up and he would take his shirt off, you know, and, and, uh, and I was like, golly, if I, if I swung that way, that would be my target. You know what I mean? <laughs> he was a beautiful human being, man. And so I went to him, his name was Tom. And I said, Tom, man, you know, I, I'm starting, my doc said I'm going to die. And, you know, I told him the whole story. He said, man, buy this book, Richard Hillman's 28 day yoga plan. There's a sponsorship opportunity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so Rich, Richard's book is is just you know and, uh, I started doing yoga and he said you know stretch your get your body back from just sitting on the couch stretch your muscles get your posture right get your body ready to start working out and I did it and and that first year I lost like 35 pounds um and then um I trained for a sprint triathlon which I finished I I, I had two goals I didn't want to die and I didn't want to crap my pants and both of those things came true. So kind of, kind of awesome. Success. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I set the bar, set the bar pretty low, you know, <laughs> finish, don't die. And, and, you know, and, and um, of course I was chasing a girl around the gym, you know, because I was I'm young and, and dumb, but it worked and, and I, I dumped a bunch of weight. And then uh, for years and years and years, I lifted and did 45 minutes of cardio five or six days a week. I, I was just like a religion. Um, I've never been a big fad diet guy, but I did do, I was extremely low carb for a long time, which worked for a little while. And then, you know, once I started riding a bike, which was kind of the next thing, um, I went way hard. My second year on the bike, I did 7,500 miles. I haven't gotten back to that point at all. I mean, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I was, all I did was practice um, and, and, and play, uh, play my trumpet and then and ride the bike. I was doing two a days, man. I was so fired up. But I was doing these 50-mile rides on net 20 carbs and lots of Red Bull. <laughs> and I think I was, I was killing myself slowly. So, you know, I kind of kind of got that back together and got back on just kind of a normal thing. Lost like 75 pounds, kept it off. I couldn't get that last 25 off. I just, for the life of me. So I went to a girl, her name is uh, Tiffany, Dr. Tiff. She's here in town, here in Nashville. Uh, wonderful exercise physiologist. She, um, PhD in both exercise and uh, nutrition. And, uh, and she said, nothing is off the table. Um, but what I want you to do is I want you to track your calories and your macronutrients. And so far I've tracked like 2,800 days in, in a row. It, it works for okay. me because it's such, a, it's such an incredible groove. I'm a big numbers guy, count everything. If I, when I'm riding my bike, I'll be like 782, 783, and I'll catch myself and I'm counting the number of pedal strokes I take and I'll get up to like hundreds, just completely right in the back of my mind. And I'm like, oh, you're dumb. One, two, two. <laughs> start all over. So man, it's the, the bike thing really made the difference. And her telling me nothing is off the table. I, I, I really can't drink beer anymore, but I do like a uh, line and Kugel summer shanty mm. uh, uh, occasionally by the pool. And she said, if you want to do it, you just got to build it into your intake that day. And uh, so I was weighing my food. Man, I was, as you can see, I'm wound up a bit tight, just laser focused on everything and, uh, and took it off. And at one point um, I was 209, uh, which for me was like, I, I was carrying 
189 pounds of uh, lean body mass. Wow. So for me, that was under 10%. And it was it just what it was so hard. It was so much work. I'm doing like burning like 1500 calories a day on the bike and just absolutely every morsel that's going in my mouth. So I backed off of that a little bit, got back up and I, I, I get, you know, winter weight is 220 and my fighting weight's about 215. And I, f I feel really good about that. Um, and meantime, the career has just been absolutely amazing. And the thing that it's done for me, obviously riding the bike with the, with the cardio and then the air intake you know, we already have as musicians, uh, clarinet, flute, you know, saxophone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not saxophone, clarinet and... Yeah, and saxophone. saxophone. Okay, yeah. so clarinet saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, I got a guy I got to introduce you to, man, who contracts down at TPAC. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and I'll hook you guys up. Sure, great. <laughs> I'm looking for gigs. Things have been shut down. I'm like, I need work. <laughs> Another sponsorship <laughs> opportunity there. Yeah, that's... Uh, but anyway... Um, you know that that uh, the, it's it's really helped my playing a lot considerably. Like the mm -hmm. length of phrases that I can play now, I just take a big old breath in, and I just seem to be able to play kind of forever. Um, I I feel better. I certainly look better. Uh, good enough to uh, win the heart of an incredible woman who is a, an amazing support system because she is she is as uh, crazy about it as I am. Um, we just we try not to bring stuff in the house that's gonna that's gonna be really yummy but somewhat hurtful. <laughs> but I will tell you, I won't have a piece of chocolate cake every once in a while just because I can. Um, whereas before, I would have a piece of I would have a piece of chocolate cake, but it would be in the shape of an entire cake. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's it's really helped me tremendously with my attitude. I, I I'm a firm believer that if you know if you're it, it, it's easier for me. It was really tough because when I was heavy, because I would walk past a plate glass window or a mirror and I'm not kidding 100 times a day and just hate what I saw. So I wasn't a big person that was like, I'm at peace with my body and this and that. And the other. I just, I never got to that point where I was comfortable, um, you know, being because, and, and if I heard one more person say, Hey, big guy, I was just going to just, Oh gosh! Imagine, imaginarily, uh, uh, pop them right in the in the schnoz. But uh, man, it's it's been tremendous because for me, uh, and and I don't know if this is the way it is for everybody because I know some large people who are beautiful, joyful, awesome, incredible people. But for me, it was a lot easier to be whole on the inside. I think those two things ran congruently for me. Um, and now when I fluctuate, I don't go into freak out mode, you know what I mean, during, during the winter or anything like that, whereas I used to, and I would immediately kind of get down and moody and broody and all that kind of stuff. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Now I'm just kind of used to the ebb and flow of, it's just like having a career in music. I mean, Jen, we were just talking about that, you know, <laughs> gigs, gigs went away for 18 months for a lot of people. And you have to have a certain mentality to kind of ride that you know, ride that wave. So that's mm -hmm. basically my story. And that's way too much information. I'm sorry. Not, not nearly enough. No. That's actually, <laughs> it's a fantastic, that's a fantastic prelude because I have so many questions and I know we've talked because you have your own podcast. That's how we met is that you interviewed me on your podcast. It seems like forever ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Right. Yeah. And how did, uh, what's, what's the premise of your podcast? How did you get started on that? Well, it's basically the same as uh, basically the same as yours. How health and fitness um, relate to creating and making music, and the the, the impetus for it, uh, the beginnings of it were: I saw this kid online, uh, trumpet player, and it, it, I heard him first, and he was a high school kid, absolutely stunningly good trump, trumpet player. And I found him on YouTube, and if he's if if he's a nickel, he's five hundred pounds. I mean, he is a large, large dude. And I I thought to myself, man, the world has to hear this. This guy could be a superstar. The world has got to hear this guy. And it was my mission for several years. Uh, but I started the podcast, and I hope that I reach one person 
and it was him because I knew that I could help him change his life by telling him my story. I was not 500 pounds, but, uh, and I found him. I found him. He's, he, I found him in college and he and I, and I said, dude, you know, th this is so strange. It's a DM on Facebook messenger. So strange. I need to talk to you. And he knew my work from Instagram, Trump and Vinny. And so that mm -hmm. kind of gave me some plain credibility. And, uh, and uh, I called him and I talked to him. I bought him a pair of stationary bicycle pedals and we got him started sitting while he practiced and while he watched TV pedaling on the machine. So, so it worked. I mean, it's like, it's like, that's like a movie. You know what I mean? It's like a script for a movie. I should write that down. Uh, you should actually. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of filmmakers. I'll put you in touch. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Make this happen. So, I have, I have some more questions. Jen, chime, chime in here if if if, uh, if you've got something. But like you said something way back um, before you went to talk to the doctor, you said that uh, you were at your heaviest right before you went to the doctor. That you you weren't feeling really comfortable in yourself, and you were starting to get session gigs and stuff like that. Like, how did did your and this is not actually something we usually talk about on this podcast. This is really kind of an interesting thing we we're talking about. Um, talking about weight and appearance and, you know, how does that affect, uh, it's a touchy subject, but how does that affect mm -hmm. or did that affect uh, your possibilities for playing when people would look at you and, and, you know, you weren't very comfortable with where you were. Did that affect your getting jobs and breaking into the industry and any of that? I think it did. And I'll, I'll be honest. I think I looked, if you saw a picture of me back then, uh, first of all, I had a, a beautiful thinning head of hair. And, uh, and it was all a nice dark color. Um, but I think I looked older at, uh, you know, in my mid thirties than I, I honestly, than I do now. Um, it just had, it just had worn me out so much. And the, the industry is about, a lot of times it's about youth, um, youth and the, the way they look. You know, we, we did some recording for, uh, what's her name? Blonde haired girl, real angsty singer, started out in country. I can never uh, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> you knew from the angsty singer part, right? We did some recording <laughs> for her, and um, and they they did a Good Morning America thing, and I saw the cats that were that were faking to our horn parts, and they were they were all six foot tall. They weighed about one hundred sixty five pounds. So they they didn't have any socks on, and their pants were real short, you know, and and they looked. And I just, I would, I would never be able to pull that off. I would definitely not be able to pull it off at over 300 pounds. I don't think um, at that time, because of my playing, that it affected me from getting hired for most gigs, for 99% of the gigs. There were probably, um, you know, I mean, I've done tons of TV and all that kind of, Big Vinny did a lot of TV. Matter of fact, I have a TV, um, I have a TV shoot tomorrow. Um, Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's all about the attitude. I have a good friend who is morbidly obese, but has such an amazing attitude. People just don't care because he's a great player and he's a great human being and they don't really care what he looks like. So yeah. I, think, I think it can kind of go either way. If somebody didn't hire me because I was fat, and I could say that as a former fat man, but if as because I was heavy, um, I didn't want to work for him anyway, because because that's not the kind of, that's not the kind of supportive place that you want to be. You know, if somebody's always busting your chops about the way you look, hey, listen to the stuff coming out of the end of my horn. I'm making you look good, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it sound great, you know. And so, yeah, I don't think I, I don't, I didn't really pay attention to it much, just because I didn't know how to. I didn't have the tools at the time to to dump the weight. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what doctor? Does, oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, just kind of while we're on the subject, it does bring up too, though, um, whether or not, and I'm, I'm projecting a little bit, but also this was true for me at my heavier weight. Um, <laughs> I think that maybe there's, um, not even maybe, there's there's definitely the potential here too that maybe we should mention is, is what I'm maybeing here. Um, if you're not feeling good about the way you look, 
even if it's like, well, you know, you're a great player or whatever, does that prevent you from getting work in the industry because you don't like yourself and your, your confidence just isn't there? Sorry. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> Sorry you know, about that. <laughs> well, that was the part, that was the part that, that was interesting to me because it was, I created a situation where I made it difficult on myself to be a, a nice and good human being. If you would have met me when I first moved to town, we, we would not be doing this podcast because I just, I made some bad, bad personal decisions mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the way I handled myself as a human being. And, mo and, and now, I mean, 20 years, 25 years ago, I have the perspective and the money morning quarterback to be able to say it, it was a direct result of the way I felt about myself. So mm -hmm. you, you love yourself you're much more capable of loving, loving it. This is just for me. I'm not saying this yeah. about anybody else. What worked for me was um, I was fat and I hated myself, so I hated everybody. It's like mm -hmm. misery loves company and you want to bring people down to your level. Now mm -hmm. it's different because I want to bring people to my level, but it is because the high road, the view from the high road is incredible. And there's not a lot of people in the way when you're walking on the high road, you know what yeah. I mean? And I just, I, I'm a firm believer in the power of, of uh, positivity and that whole mm -hmm. thing. But I think that has, it's been easier for me because I feel better about my, about the way that I look and my physical state. Yeah. For me, it doesn't work that way for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, there are, there are plenty of positive, super, super positive people out there who are larger and, I, I, I love those people. I really do. I have a couple of them I, I talk to regularly. It's like, I will have you around every day of the week. And the nice turnaround from that is, you know, there's certain bigger people who, when you've lost the weight and you're super active, they're like, oh. And there's the ones who are really confident in themselves, like the ones I'm talking about. They're like, oh, that's great that you went out and did this thing. I will never join you, but it's great that you did <laughs> 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 Good for you. <laughs> very true. That's very, very true. And 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 listen, I mean, I'm at a point in my career. Where I'm doing a lot of stuff from this studio that you you see me in here. It's a big 25 by 25 room. Um, just super kind of like you build it and they will come, you know. And, and I'm still doing a ton outside of that, but it's just like now I have the luxury of being able to call the people who I love. Mm -hmm. absolutely love and and without expecting anything in return they love me and instead of a, a trombone player or a saxophone player sitting down the section when i'm doing a high pass going yes sir yes sir yes sir you know because that happens uh these guys i can feel these guys lifting me up and saying dude that's hard you got this and they, and, and you know 99 times out of 100 because of that energy in the room so whether it's a big person or a small person uh, or uh, male, female, anything it, it, in my life, if they're good, I want more of it because yeah. it, it helps me to be good. It helps me to be better. It's accountability. It's, it's um, affirmation. It's positivity. It's, you know, it's, it's all that stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely down. And again, for me, it's as a result of a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. both my career and my weight loss, a lot of hard work and a lot of discipline and some sacrifices um, that you have to make. You can't just wish it away. The other thing about like a 313 pound person, you know what you want to do is you want to go and you want to blink your eyes and you want to be 100 pounds lighter. It took me 39 years to get to 313 pounds in one form or fashion. Um, and I'm sure you guys are big proponents of this. A person that's 450 pounds is going to lose weight very quickly when they change their habits, their diet, their water intake, whatever they do. But eventually, anybody who needs to lose 25, 30 or more, if you set a goal in my mind of one pound a week, if I ran into a guy, if I ran into myself at 39, at 313 pounds, and I said, Man, if you're diligent in two years, I can have you right where you want to be. I would have, I would have signed that deal with the devil in a minute. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> it took you a long time to get here, 
it took you a long time to become kind of a jackass. It's going to take you a little while. It's like you're going 100 miles an hour in this direction. You have to slow the car down. You have to turn it around. You have to speed it back up before you can go in exactly the opposite direction really quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what I encourage people. You know, you have to be patient um, yeah. and with because it's a long game, really is mm -hmm. long game. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going way off subject. I'm so sorry. Not at all. No, it's oh, nothing's not off the table. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. And you know, you said that about uh, Dr. Jen. I'm sorry, not Dr. Jen. This is Dr. Jen. Right. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Tip. And what she what she's saying is nothing is off the table. And if I'm understanding you right, that's that there's something out there called uh they I abbreviate, abbreviate it I I F Y M if it fits your macros. Mm -hmm. So is that, that's basically what you've been following, yeah? Yes, yes. Tiffany Breeding is her name, Dr. Tiff. And, and you guys, you, man, you guys should meet her because she is just, she is just a wonderful human being uh, and, and super encouraging. And like I said, when you walk in, she tests your numbers and she says, you know, this is not going to be that hard. Here's what you got to do. It's like, it's like my first trumpet teacher, Al Carroll. When I'm nine years old and I go in in my third trumpet lesson, he says, okay, I'm going to play a note and I just want you to play the same note as me. And he plays a high F, which for trumpet players is in the upper tessitura. And I said, okay. And I play a high F and he says, play it again. And I play it again, nine years old. And of course he's sitting there peeing his pants because, you know, he knows how rare this is, but he never told me it was difficult. Right. All these people that are saying, oh, lift heavy things is really hard and losing weight is really hard and blah, 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 blah. You know, let me tell you what's really hard. Having diabetes is really hard. Really hard. Mm -hmm. I don't know because I've never been pre-diabetic or anything, but I know people who have died from diabetes. Having a heart attack, super hard. Having a stroke. You know, all these things that are weight related and your heart is in there just working its tail off, but because it's, you know, because it's packed in there with all this other extra stuff, it's having mm -hmm. to work twice as hard. That's what's hard. Using self-control to push away from the table or say, I'm not going to eat that, or I'm going to walk a mile, or I'm going to swim a mile, or I'm going to bike 50 miles. That's, that's easy. That's easy. Yeah. Once you get there. And, and you guys are both practicers. You're both musicians. It's the same exact discipline that you use to practice your horn every freaking day. And people like who are not in music, they're like, you still practice? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Like, you know, it's, and, and trying to explain to a doctor, like I have a chiropractor friend and he knows more. He's a, uh, he's a, a bicycle um, long distance champion in Alabama. And the, the next year, he was a powerlifting champ. But he's got thighs on him like, that are the size of Earl Campbell's, you know. <laughs> a real dichotomy, like a, like a unicorn kind of guy. He knows a lot about the physiology of the, of the body. And, 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 and I've lost my train of thought. But um, You were talking about discipline and the practicing. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's just, it's exactly this. It's exactly the same, you know, you get up at eight o'clock. Oh, we were, he and I were talking about like, he, he does chiropractic work eight hours a day. I said, okay. So I had, had an eight hour session the other day, but before my eight hour session, I warmed up for 90 minutes. So imagine sitting at home and doing like adjusting, practicing, adjusting people, like air adjusting people for an hour and a half before you go to work. And, and people just can't, Mm -hmm. We don't see about it, but we do have to have a lot of discipline to be to be great players. And mm -hmm. uh, I find that it's exactly the same muscle. You're using the same muscle when you do the the diet and exercise thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah applying well, that discipline to other areas. Yeah, yeah. And I th I think you know people are like, oh, you still practice, like, or I I would get you know freshman in music right and in college, and I'd get the wait so you you play every day <laughs> you know, like, like as a performance major that was their first question wait so you you play every day and I'm like so I think that 
for me, a lot of that was, and, and a lot of the questions of like, well, you still practice? I'm like, you realize that I started doing this because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like starting, starting the harder parts of exercising, which is basically just showing up in my opinion. Um, and dieting is, is a different story as far as I'm concerned. Um, cause a lot of people just like don't understand how bad they feel, but we'll put that aside. Um, <laughs> But the movement thing, I'm like, you know, when you were a kid and you used to run around and it was fun, like, <laughs> like mm-hmm. what did you do when you were a kid that was fun? Like you, you get a bunch of adults out and you put a swing in front of them and nine times out of 10, they're going to sit on the swing and they're going to swing. Like, it's fun. <laughs> That's true. And, and the bike thing, man, I remember getting on my bike with the gang, man, when I was mm-hmm. a kid and we would just, we never thought about, oh my God, here comes a hill or you know, none of that stuff. It was incredible. We would go, who knows how far we went when we were kids, but miles and miles and miles of miles on crappy little banana seed yep. you know, yep. bikes, man. Now, you know, it's just uh, really amazing. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Same here. Same here. I had a rainbow bright banana seed bike. Heck yeah, you did. I know, right? <laughs> and I had the screamers and all of it. All, all of it. When I got it at like, 10 <laughs> speed. It was it was a it was a rite of passage. That was graduation. I was the big kid on a ten speed. But I mean, like you come home from school and you get on your bike. That's what you did. You rode around the neighborhood, kids. You rode from subdivision to sub. Well, at least I did subdivision to subdivision. And you just my parents didn't know where I was. They just knew I was around somewhere close. I was on my bike. They didn't worry about it. <laughs> I was a, I was a bit of a skate rat for a while, and, and uh, in my community we had a big. We called it the big hill. I went back several years ago, and I was like. Wow, that hill is not that big. Not that but, big. Uh, you know, for several years, I would, it was probably, it was probably at least a mile there. I would skate all the way there and we would stay there for three or four hours. And then when it was getting to be dinner time, I'd skate home. And I can't even imagine what, you know, the calories that you were burning <laughs> during that time, just constant motion. And, and I just talked to a friend of mine today, right before I got on with you, with you guys. Um, uh, and he's, he saw another, podcast that I did and uh he said man the former fat guy really spoke to me and I said <laughs> well let's get after it man and he said you know he's already on the water uh he's a little over 300 pounds amazingly gifted trumpet player like the like he's a classical guy and he plays flugelhorn and he plays these melodies that I, they every time I hear one of his videos I turn it off I turn to the right or the left here and I start practicing because I am not worthy to be in the same planet as that guy. And, and, but he's I got, love people like that. Yeah, man. He's got this one hang up and it's that he's fat. He said, man, I was up in uh, Toronto for a while and I had to walk everywhere. I stopped drinking beer and I walked like six miles a day and I lost 40 pounds. And I'm like, wow. And I'm like, okay, you, you, you don't need any help. You, you know what to do. We all yeah. know what to do. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> right. We really do. Dr. Jim, when you were talking about the, the getting, getting to the gym, that's the hardest exercise there is, man. Getting your mm-hmm. butt on, putting your kit on, getting on your bike, taking the trip to the gym. I, I, I set up a trainer in here um, with Zwift um, during the winter. And the walk from here to there, it might as well be 150 miles. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, but, you know, once you get there, you you realize, you know, um, how much fun it is and how easy it is. It's really, really yeah. remarkable. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I, what I tell my clients, and I found this to be true for myself, um, yeah. what I tell my clients is that you've just got to find your groove. All these methods that are out there for weight loss or for fat loss, I should say, not just weight loss, for fat yeah. loss, almost all of them work but they're not appropriate for everybody. I mean, if I, if you told me to go low carb or low fat, I would just look at you and laugh. I'm not doing that. But if you tell me to eat a little bit less and slow down and enjoy it, I realize how little food I really need. I'm a small person. I really, I just really eat too much, you know, and it's super easy to actually to just dial it back. And when I've got, when I've got it in like Tupperware and I take it, I take my lunch with me to gym and I portion it mm-hmm. properly. I realize, mm-hmm. well, it looks so small. And then I eat it and like, no, well, that's actually fine. I yeah. mean, it's really not that bad. And so that, but that's my jam. And you know, there's, there's all these different things that, 
that I just tell my clients, like if it fits your macros or maybe intermittent fasting or, you know, all these different things are all viable. You just have to yeah. find the right one that works for you. And I'll tell you about all of them. And here's the ones right. I think are going to work for you based off your personality, your schedule, your lifestyle. But you just got to find your groove. When you find your groove, this isn't going to be hard. This is just like yeah. everything else. I, I think it's the same with, with the exercise that you choose. Uh, Jen, when, when, uh, when, when we first started talking, you said, I play clarinet and saxophone. I have a, a doctorate. And, and then you said, and I love lifting heavy things. I do. I thought, <laughs> I, I thought you know, that's, that's a person that has a passion for, for a lot of different things. And some people can put a kettlebell in their hand and they're like, no. So I always, I always tell people, you know, like, like my, my guy that I, that I got the pedals for. If you, you know, if you drop 30 pounds doing this and then you discover it's the bane of your existence, then walk. Then I, I wouldn't recommend a 450 pound guy run, but jumping on a treadmill and walking at a little incline, you know, at maybe two, three miles an hour, just something that makes you move. Find your find your groove. Find your groove with your cardio and mm -hmm. your and your weight bearing exercise, and then find your groove with your food. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just like I have a trumpet player friend here in town who called me and said, "Man, I really want to get on this. I really want to get on this health train." And I said, "Well, what do you eat?" He said, "Well, generally, I'll eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day a uh, Totino's frozen pizza." An entire frozen pizza. I'm like, one for the whole day. He's like, no, one a meal. Wow. And, and, and the thing is, man, is that he doesn't have the benefit or the understanding or the knowledge to realize, even at 35 years old, that that, is, that may not be the right, the right choice. I mean, look, I'm, all, I'm down for a pizza, right? Mm -hmm. I'm down for a slice of pizza. But we're talking about times per year where's the nutrition in that really i mean because yeah you can lose weight eating twinkies because you only eat a few and you're still had a caloric <laughs> deficit or pizzas i mean if you if you if it fits your macros but that's just that's your calories not your macros you're not going to hit your protein macros macronutrients yeah. you're not going to hit your fiber no the fiber the thing, man, I, don't, I don't know how the guy functions without without you know like drinking a whole bottle of metamucil I mean, but yeah. you know and it's one of those things where you tell them and this is what works for me you know and sometimes it is a baked chicken breast and some broccoli and some couscous or some rice whatever it is and and it's it's not glamorous it's not pretty all the time but you know you can dress it up you know you can dress those things up when i first started with tiff that was the thing that i had to learn how to do i kind of had to learn how to kind of recook Starting very simple and adding little things at a time that weren't going to affect the, you know, the, the overall picture uh, that much. So, you know, it's, it's just, man, it's just actually talking to people like you who are educated and who are experts and who actually do this for a living. Um, that's the way to go. You know, you'll go out and you'll spend, you know, 60 or $80 at a bar on beers and peanuts. Take that 60 or 80 bucks and get yourself a lesson and, and, you know, and, and help yourself be healthier. That's, I, I mean, I applaud you guys for, for taking the time to, to learn the skill and, 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 and then to be able to communicate it to people in a very effective way. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> I want to, I want to talk about the bike bag for just a second, because this, this is something that, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, let's turn left here. <laughs> now, I mean, this is exercise, right? So, so Vinny, you're talking about like how you got involved with the bike and how it, it, you know, some people might think road bike. Some people might think mountain bike. Some people might think motorcycle. I mean, you know, let's talk about this. So how did you told me uh, when I met you that you actually have this, this bike bag that I, I think you put under the tour bus when you were touring with, Martina. was it Martina McBride? Yeah, I, um, well, first of all, I started out like anybody else. I bought a bike off of Craigslist. It was too big. I went into a bike shop and I didn't have, cle I didn't have shoes. I didn't have pedals. I didn't have a helmet. I didn't have any kits or jerseys or anything. And I went in and, and I was a little bit larger at the time, certainly for, um, for, you know, to go into a bike shop. You know, the bunch of those guys that are going in, you know, the guys that are winning the, the hills or the fronts are like, 
five Super three, 126 pounds, you know, and they're solid muscle. Um, yeah. They look like little ballerinas on those bikes, and that's, that's pretty <laughs> phenomenal. The guys, the guys behind the counter, and I won't tell you what the shop was, the guys behind the counter, first of all, they're like, oh, where'd you buy this bike? And I was like, oh, I found it on Craigslist Marketplace. Like, oh, well, it's too big for you. And I said, well, you know, can, can we make it work? Well, I guess so. I mean, for a guy your size. And they started alluding to all this, you know, all this stuff. Now, little did they know that I was about to drop almost $1,000 at their shop on accessories. And yeah. if you know anything about the bike world, they're not making a ton of money on bikes. What they make money on is helmets and shoes and cleats and kits and heart rate monitors and sunglasses. And that's everything that I bought. A thousand and garments and right. light. Right. Thousand dollars worth of crap at, at you know at 50 points. I paid the rent that day and I never stepped foot in that joint again. Now here's what's cool about that. Uh, they don't know. I didn't think it was worth my time to to lay any kind of wisdom on it. Because you know my money's green whether I'm fat or skinny. It's um, true. But since then, I have purchased six bikes, countless sets of wheels, countless tubes, countless tires, countless gear. I would, I would venture to say, and I'm not using hyperbole, in the, I started cycling in 2007. So what's that, 14 years, 15 mm -hmm. years? $50,000. Easily $50,000. The bike that's yeah. sitting in the garage right now is a eight thousand dollar bike. I didn't pay eight thousand yeah. dollars, thank God, but it's an eight thousand. <laughs> and you know Just what? Out of they, curiosity, what is it? It's an Argon eighteen Gallium Pro. Ooh. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I think you had a Giant or a Specialized or something, but if I, I had a Can Cannondale. That I was, was good. Cannondale. It was Cannondale guy because they make them for you know for larger you know the weight limit on those bikes were, were yeah. a little bit were a little bit more, but those guys could have had every penny of that money. Mm -hmm. If they just would have been decent human beings. So I, when we went out on tour with uh, Martina, a couple of things happened. We, I found the, the love of my life in a coffee maker, um, a Euro coffee maker, which they had on the bus. And you press this button, it would make all this noise and this beautiful, you know, the, the, the life liquid would come out of it. And have to <laughs> drink it like a junkie, you know, and, uh, <laughs> So much so that we wound up buying one, and now my wife is just completely hooked, you know, and, and uh, which is wonderful. Um, and I, <laughs> I realized that we, because we were just doing like um, weekends, so we'd leave late on a Thursday night, we'd be home by Sunday night. But that three days a week was, was really kind of racking my, my schedule. And so I did, I bought the bike bag, and, and, and it, you know, it just, it's a, basically the frame just sits in there you put the wheels in there it's a really cool thing you know it's <laughs> really cool it's really cool and it fits right under the bus and, and it didn't piss anybody off and so i got to ride with some really super cool people in some amazing places uh all across the country uh, because i had the bike and i it was a daily routine man putting it together and taking it apart and drying my socks on the front of the bus and all that kind of yeah. stuff just absolutely phenomenal, man. So cool. And 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 um, being able to share it too. Now it's been to Alaska with you. Where else? Did <laughs> it went to Alaska you? last year with me. And you've gone somewhere else with it, haven't you? No, uh, probably. Florida. I don't remember. I, I don't remember. Doesn't I happen. think, yes, Florida. No, it's been all over. It's been all over the country. The most, it's about to go to Texas. The, the best traveled uh, bike bag that they sell. I wish I could remember the name of the company and other sponsorship. Uh, Is it like no, no, there's something or, or it starts with an S, Novaro or some, something, I, don't know. I forget. But <laughs> Vinny is nice enough to have let me borrow this thing. And if you're on my uh, Instagram or Facebook, you'll, you'll see, I did a time-lapse video when I was in Alaska with the army band last year. Boy, you should have seen the looks on my unit's faces when I hauled this thing out of my car. They're like, what is that? I'm like, it's my bike. <laughs> like, can you? Can you put that on a set? Okay, on a plate. Is that okay? I'm like, well, it's gone. <laughs> they gave me all kinds of things. And I was like, too late now. I mean, I checked. They said we could have whatever. So it went and they, I mean, they were just like, okay. And so like, we're going to Texas in a couple weeks with the army band. And they're like, Angela, you're bringing your bike? I'm like, I can't bring my bike. Any chance, because, 
you never know when you travel, if you're going to be in a beautiful place and you had wished, and if you're a cyclist, if you had wished you had brought something. So if there's something you love, whether it's rollerblading or running or biking or, or skateboarding, like bring, find a way to bring something that you love because you never know when you're going to be somewhere and you wish you'd had it. And if you had it, you could go and enjoy it instead of sitting around wishing you had it. That's yeah. It. I, I've met people um, on, on that tour um, that, that, you know, like we would have a day off and they would take me out to dinner and take me back to their house. And, and, you know, we'd watch the sunset together. We're still friends. Uh, that tour was five or six years ago. And I get little, um, DMS from, from people all the time, all over the country, happy birthdays, you know, and different occasions and whatnot. And, and then of course, when you're a member of the Strava community, which is a, which is a, you know, social app for, excuse me, for exercise, you can comment on their rides and catch up with them. And it's, it's really fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And, and, you know, the cycling community is an interesting bunch of guys. I am one of those guys that, like, I wave at everybody. That is, like, it's something that a lot of cyclists don't do. I'll be like, hey, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, or the, or the whole thing with the cars. Okay. Oh, gosh. Here's, Here the, deal with, here's the deal with the cars. Cars are bigger. <laughs> Cars are always going to win. So mm -hmm. be nice to cars. Don't, <laughs> don't be an ass. Don't be one of those elitist persons that, you know, if you're going up a hill at six miles an hour, that's 12 degrees, you know, get off to the side, get off to the shoulder because people are in a hurry to go to work and they will run you over. We all know that. Yeah. You know? So just be nice. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a goes back to that everything kind of goes back to that you could just solve so many problems political mm -hmm. religious skinny fat don't be a jerk don't be that's a it jerk. that's it don't be a jerk maybe that'll be my that's new the title of our don't i think that's the title of this episode <laughs> <laughs> don't be a jerk with Vinny. <laughs> don't be a jerk with Vinny shishels <laughs> that's uh that's i don't know yeah. that'll work so yeah so you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, there's the, there's the, I don't want to get into too much into it, but you know, there's that whole thing of like, yeah, bikes share the road. I mean, it is technically, and you know, if you're on a hill or you're on a blind curve, don't pass them. But you know, I, I know in middle Tennessee where we are, there's not a lot of bike paths. We don't have a whole lot of places to go. We got to share the road. It just is what it is. And yeah, it's inconvenient. And I'm sorry if I slowed you down by 10 seconds, but your emergency is not my problem. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, I want to veer from that lest we get down the cycling path too much. And I, I want to ask real quick um, on the, so you've done a lot of tours. I'd love for you to tell us some of the tours that you've done, but what are some of the challenges that you face uh, physically, like staying healthy on a tour? I started uh, my first tour. Uh, I got here in 92. I did the Christmas show at the hotel back when they used to have a Christmas show. I had, okay. I had told all these people that I was moving to Nashville and I was going to go be a, a, you know, a country music trumpet star. And the very first week we were there, we did this thing called the Yule, the Yule log ceremony. Okay, <laughs> So several hours before the call for the show, which was, you know, kind of a variety Christmas show, play in the orchestra, I would, <laughs> I would put on a, kind of a choir robe and we would sort of march down the hall and every night in the lobby there, they had this gigantic uh, fireplace and they would take a log and they would anoint it with turkey fat and they would light the fire every night. The Yule log. Right, the Yule log. And I would go, <laughs> right, so I, and, and, but it paid an extra, I think I was making like, at that time, I was making like, 850 a week for the shows, but it paid an extra $250 a week. So I was making $1,100 a week, which was more money than I knew what to do with back then. I'd do it. Yeah. And, yeah. We were getting, and this is in 92, right? So I had told all my friends, you know, I'm, I'm, moved, I'm, I'm I went to San Antonio, Texas, and then I'm going to move to Nashville. I'm going to get a gig and all this kind of stuff. And CNN came and filmed the Yule Log ceremony. And don't you know it, there I am in my choir robe. Bum, ba, ba, da, ba, da. <laughs> Several of my friends were like, what in the world is <laughs> happening? So 
awful. Just, just, I mean, you look, man, I'll take the money, but I was just, I was just like, can I stand behind somebody? Please don't get me on camera. This is just going to be horrific. <laughs> a couple of my good buddies gave me, gave me a raft of, of hard time, but it was fine. Then, um, you know, when I first got here, everybody was like five year plan. And I was like, man, I, don't, I can't have a five year plan. I got to have a one year plan. I need money right now. Mm -hmm. We were so broke, we couldn't pay attention. And uh, at the end of my first year, I was supposed to do the Christmas show on the boat. I, I was on the, uh, the General Jackson floating up down the river. And uh, through, a, through a, just a magical series of events, Shelby Lynn came out to hear me play. I took a night off work, which is a rare thing because I, I, I was really, we needed the money. And the, the, the band leader had invited me to come out. He said, I don't want you to play lead in the first set. I'll do it. I want you to play lead in the second set. I said, okay. So I, I saw her walk in. She had done a record. I had heard she was going to do a tour. And as I was walking out, she said, hey, come here. I said, hi. <laughs> she said, I need a lead trumpet player for my tour, and I want it to be you. And nice. we went out for six weeks. Um, we opened up for Kenny Rogers. And we did two shows a day, six days a week. We never had a hotel. We kind of showered at the venue. We would have a hotel on our days off. We made 750 bucks a week. I cannot remember a happier time. When I, when I left the club that night and she hired me, I literally howled out the window on the way home. So that was kind of Amazing. the beginning. And then uh, my next gig was with a guy named Michael English, who was a contemporary Christian um, singer. And... Uh, the guy who hired me said, I need you to commit to this gig for a year. And I said, yeah, sure. So in the spring, we did it. We did the double awards. He won seven double awards that year. Wow. And then one day I'm sitting there. We had gotten a hundred dollar a day raise for the fall. We were taking the summer off for the fall and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I hear this commercial on TV that says gospel music rocked at its foundation. And I'm like, what? the artists, several of the artists had gotten together for some extracurricular activities on the tour and both married, pregnant, the whole nine yards, the tour just absolutely torched the tour. Oh no. Like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And I'm not kidding now. I had, you have to remember, I had committed for the whole year and I, and I believe that you have to do, you know, what you say you're going to do. Right. About two weeks later, I get a call from a friend of mine down in Muscle Shoals, Harvey Thompson, and he says, hey, man, Lyle Lovett wants to use a horn section. Do you want to go out and audition for him? So we did a gig, and, um, and, and we, we got the gig. And then so from 2000 and whatever it was, I mean, 1994 through 2007, I toured almost every summer with Lyle. Life-changing experience. But... If Michael hadn't screwed up, <laughs> you wouldn't have gotten that chance. I wouldn't have gotten that gig because I would have had to stay with the with the Michael English thing. So uh, that did Lyle um, Winona. Um, in 2000, we made a record for Kirk Franklin, a live record for Kirk uh, Franklin called "The Rebirth." Yeah. And, and so over right around 2001, oh, 2000, I did Carmen, the contemporary oh. con contemporary Christian singer. He was huge in that year. Interesting experience. Uh, uh, yeah, it, very interesting experience, but great gig. Um, met a lot of really cool people. Um, I mean, for my very first gig, you know, Victor Krause and, and Pat Bergeson and uh, Charles Rose and all those guys, I still hang out and play with those guys still. Um, then I did Kirk. We did Kirk. The last day of the Kirk tour, we flew to Milwaukee and did Lyle for three months had a week off at home, went back and did Kirk Franklin again for 10 weeks, and then had a couple weeks at home, and then went back out with Lyle. I was gone almost 12 out of 14 months. Wow. That was, my bank account was super happy, but my family <laughs> life was just, and my personal life was just, you know. And this sure. is after, after my divorce and I'd started losing weight. And then, uh, you know, I've, I've done some shorter tours, but, you know, um, and we were supposed to do six weeks with Martina. And she loved the horn so much, we wound up doing two years. It was phenomenal. That's awesome. 
awesome. We still, we are still six years later. Honest to goodness, we still have some of that money in savings. Best paying job I ever had. Great group of people. She is off the charts, sweet and nice. Like the the, the part that she plays always, that's how she is. Like when you meet her, she's exactly how you want her to be. And I never saw it falter. I never saw her turn around and be anything but sweet and wonderful and nice. And John McBride was crazy positive. I, I wish I could tell you what he would come into the dressing room and say to us at the end of the gig sometime. But it involved uh, a word that starts with an F. Oh. And he would come in and he would say, you guys blankety blank rock and turn around and leave. And I'm like... <laughs> You can't get much more affirming than that, right? I mean, there's there's not much you can say to a person to to say, good job, than that. And the biggest challenge, honest to goodness, for me on every single one of those tours, especially the Kirk Franklin tour, because we carried catering with us. And oh. I want to tell you, I, this this is, this is not this is a reflection on me, not the tour or anybody on the tour. The simply the best fried chicken I have ever tasted in my entire existence. And when they, <laughs> they would put that yard bird out on the table, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, entire, entire little clucking Inhale it. would go away. Yeah. Um, catering. Oddly enough, catering and, uh, you know, I guess what you'd call craft services. We'd get into the dress room in the afternoon. And like the wedding bands I played with in the 90s, their dinner spread would pale in comparison to what we had just in the dressing room. I mean, just absolutely everything, including any kind of alcohol that you were there. I'd be like, I feel like having some vodka tonight. And the road manager would stick his head around the door, the door and go, I'll have it for you in 20 minutes. And <laughs> he would go. And I'd be like, I mean, I, okay. Kind of you <laughs> get back off the tour and you're like, uh, you go to a bar and they're, and they're like five bucks and you're like five bucks for what? Oh crap! Oh, I have to pay for that. I have to pay <laughs> uh -huh. for this. Uh huh. Uh -huh. In the world, yeah. So, um, catering because there is unlimited amounts of really, really yummy food, and so mm. you have to be super, super aware of portion control and and what you're mm. putting in your body because if if you're a drinker, you are going to drink every night. Because you get on the bus and it's just like for two hours after the show, everybody's like, we just did a show. Woo! And you know, you're kind of, kind of trying to come down and so a couple of, a couple of road sodas, you know. And, and uh, so you have to be really, really careful of that. That was the challenge for me. When I first started losing weight, you know, um, I, did, I did the yoga, which was easy to do in my room, put down a towel and just kind of, I mean, I can't even imagine what my, what my sets used to look like. Like if a real yoga person would look at them, they'd be like, what, what are you trying to do? <laughs> myself up let me help you. Let me, sh let me just show you one or two. I, I dated a girl who was a yogi and, and, and I was like, well, this is what I do. And she's like, mm, 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 no, no. <laughs> but it's working. Look, I can, you know, I can, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I still actually, from that book, David Hittleman's 28 day sponsorship. Um, uh, I still do. I just did it not two hours ago. I still do one of the routines every single day for the last 25 years um, to keep myself, you know, young and flexible. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, but um, yeah, that's I know. What I would say. you know, staying uh, because like on some of those tours, like with Lyle, we'd work like, first of all, we were staying at Ritz Carlton's. Crazy. Darn. Crazy cool gig. I mean, Lyle was, again, like a Texas gentleman. He did love Texas. Speaking of Texas, you know, if you're not from Texas, you're not worth a flip if you're from Texas. You know what I'm saying? Texas is by far the biggest, ugliest, hottest, hellish place on the face of God's green earth. Looking forward to being there in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. We're making it sound great. You are gonna sweat your bottom off. Oh my gosh, man! Make sure you are well 
hydrated because it is hotter than the first level of hell down there. You know, those army uniforms don't breathe real well. I don't care oh. what they say. And those combat boots don't breathe at all. And so this is not going to be Alaska. Man, we had it made last year. Thanks. Uh, Good to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would definitely take some short pants and some kits and whatnot. But uh, yep. yeah, so uh, so it just we, we were staying at Ritz Carlton's home of the thirty five dollar cheeseburger, but really the best cheeseburger you ever put in your pie hole. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, just and, and Lyle's catering uh, was was the best by far. I mean, he was he was very particular about feeding everybody really well, keeping everybody really happy. Man, it was. I've had some really, I've had some really, really extraordinary experiences on the road. I, I will go out on the road for the right um, price, I guess is what it is. But uh, I mean, I, I kind of got spoiled with my last road gig because it was, you know, my wife and I were sitting there and I said, I don't want to go on the road. This is a great story. I don't want to go on the road anymore. She's like, well, I mean, if somebody calls with a, you know, a bag full of cash, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to set my price. And we discussed the price. I'll tell I'll tell you what it was. Uh, not from a braggadocious standpoint. Just uh, I'm trying to encourage people who want to have a career in music and anybody that's yeah, there's no money in music and all that stuff. So I sat there and I said, I want a thousand dollars a day. And I, you know, puff my chest. Yeah. The next day, and I'm not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> December twelfth, two thousand fourteen, two thousand thirteen, December. Uh, 13th, I got an email and it's a production assistant and she says, hey, we got this little gig. It's down in um, Atlanta at the Fox Theater. Um, it's a tribute to uh, Greg Allman from the Allman Brothers and here's who's going to be on the show and it read like a freaking who's who. Don was from Was Not Was, bass player who has produced the Stones since the mid-90s until now is the band leader and the guys in the band are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, one of these things is not like the other. And it was me. <laughs> so the end of the email says, <clears throat> it's a three-day gig. Would $3,000 be enough? You should have said no. You needed four or something. <laughs> so... Fast forward now, you go to the gig, it's in January, right? And I'm, I'm in heaven, Beth is there. And it's just like, I mean, there is just, like every person you could ever imagine is singing these songs and we're just back there too. And somebody would come out on stage and be like, oh my God. I mean, it's just incredible. <laughs> and so John McBride is there. And he says, ah, come on out to the bus, come on, come on, come on. And we had done a record for, for Martina in August and it was finally done, takes me out on the bus. He's de he is deaf, puts it on stun, and I'm sitting there, and the music starts coming out, and it's like, oh, my God. I mean, it was phenomenal. And he says to me, sitting in the front of the bus, completely unexpected, we want to tour this thing. I want you to be the, the leader. I want you to put together the horn section. We want as many of the guys that played on the record as possible. What's it going to cost? Well, what do you think I said? <laughs> And then what do you think he said? Uh -huh. He said, okay. <laughs> and that's how that story goes. So now. I love it. If somebody calls and they're like, we got 50 dates at 600 bucks a night. I'm like, mm. most people would be like, hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I find myself being like, oh, I don't know. You think I, you know, like just completely just so far out of my just crazy. That's so, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It was really, it was really remarkable. We did, uh, we did um, ninety dates the first year and ninety dates the second year. Wow. So if you're good at math <laughs> and you need a loan, I'm your guy. <laughs> we've, we've tried to be a really good steward of the things uh, that we've been given and that we've earned. Um, hence the the saltwater pool. I'm going to take a dip in as soon as I'm done with you, ladies. Uh, but it, it's just. It's, it's really remarkable. And, and I will say, it all kind of stems right back to being alive. Because mm. you remember what the doctor said, you're fat and you're going to die. And if I hadn't made that change, and, and see, you know, you, you, you guys might be able to do it as professionals to say to your client, listen, I'm, I'm worried about you, man. Your, your heart rate is 194. 
and you're sitting on a bench. <laughs> so, you know, you might be able to say that, but somebody like me, I can't go to my friend who called me today and say, you know, because the first thing that strikes you about him on the recordings is that this beautiful trumpet sound, and, and he's a large dude, and you want to go, dude, this is what my guy said to me. It might apply to you. Let's let's get this thing together. You know what I mean? So I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you got to be alive to make a thousand dollars a day, and <laughs> and then to to not spend as much of it as you can. You know, so you can so you can live a, a really awesome life. So I don't know. Yeah. Any of that makes sense? Yeah. I gotta talk so much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point. It's <laughs> People heard us enough. They want to hear your story. Right, right. This is like the Sahara. I've been talking. (laughs) Thank you for bringing up that point about you know like charging because I know like okay you're the first person we have talked to who's in the session world and touring world Mm -hmm. and I know Mm -hmm. like that's that's a dream job of mine uh, eventually. Not that I don't love what I do, but I've always wanted to play on movie soundtracks and you know stuff like that. Another friend of mine, he actually said, "Oh, I think we could have you out on tour." He was the uh, drummer for John Legend for a while. He's like, oh, we could have you out on tour. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, and he said, for about $1,000 a day. And I went, oh, that'd be good, too. That'd be good. Yeah, I, I would take it. Of course, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work out, but um, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But that was the first time it opened my eyes to, like, musicians are not all poor. We don't have to be poor. Can we please stop this game? And just, just hearing some, like, real live numbers, like, look, this, if you keep practicing and if you keep up your craft and you're able to do that by taking care of your body, you can actually make a living at this and you don't have to quote, sell out or whatever. Great. It's nice to hear that. Yeah. Listen, you know, uh, it's common knowledge what a master session pays. If you go to the AFM, uh, uh, you know, webpage, you can look it up, but it's basically about 160 bucks an hour. Now, there is almost nothing I can do for $160 an hour. I'm not that pretty uh, to make that to make that kind of money. You know what I mean? But then when you are when you like, I, th- this room is what sold me on the house. That and then uh, did I mention the pool? Um, <laughs> yeah, and and the fact that my wife would live here with me and and continue to live here with me. That the, that was the big thing that she that she tolerates my my dumbass uh, at all. But, so that's that's a wonderful thing. But like, um, uh, I built this this studio here, and just just in the last couple of weeks, like um, we did an overdub for a, a girl named Lacey K. Booth. Lacey K. is uh, was a runner up on Idol in 2019 before the Corona year. Beautiful singer, beautiful person, super positive, just amazing, and like a Grammy winning uh, producer calls. And says, hey man, we got this tune and we need it done. So I call a trombone player and we sit in here. So I got double scale plus an instrument double. So you take that 500, you add 25% to it, then you times it times two, and then you um, you add the studio cost. And we work, <laughs> we work for an hour and five minutes. So, so anybody, like I had a guy, man, when I was in Baltimore and, and he comes up to, we're, we're at this wedding factory, right? And he comes up and he puts his arm around me and there's this trio of like old as dirt men playing and they just look, you know, it's like you'd have to shake them to make sure they weren't wax figures. And he, puts his <laughs> on me and he goes, look at that, it's your future. I was like, 20, I was 27, 28 years old. And I looked at him and I said, I didn't have any idea how I would get from there to here, being able to tell these stories. But I said, not on your life. And I did a record. Uh, I think it was the one I was talking about earlier with with Stephen. On that record, we did uh, over 18 months, we did a bunch of sessions down on Muscle Shoals. It was Vince Gill, Michael McDonald, Grace Potter, Demi Lovato, um, um, Kebmo, 
God, who else was on that day? Was that it? <laughs> <laughs> Only. <laughs> and, then it, and then it culminated with 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 Stephen. And and the Stephen day was was remarkable. Stephen Tyler was standing this close to my face, going, play it. And I'm like, oh my God, who's Stephen Tyler? I love you. <laughs> From Aerosmith, for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so you know, the whole day went went incredibly well. And at the, you know, at the end of the session, I said, "Man, they said we're done. Come on in, guys." And it's the whole crew, and the, you know, and the, and the, and uh, it, it was just amazing. And I said, "Well, give me, give me a pass." And and on the end of this, we did brown sugar. Uh, and on the end of this, I just want to take one of these licks up an octave because I think it'll add a little sparkle to it. And so I did it four times in a row. And, and I'm, I don't hear anything. I'm like, they're like, come on in. We, we, we think that'll be good. And I walk into the, to the control room and the control room, 20 people erupts into laughter and, and applause and the whole nine yards. And Steven goes, come here, come here, come here. And he sits me down in his chair and he says, wait till you hear this. And as we listen to it, he's giving me a shoulder massage. I'm like, David <laughs> Tyler is giving me a shoulder massage. Oh my God. It's so hysterically funny. We did three sessions that day. And that was another day that was a, just a wonderful surprise where we got double scale for all the sessions. Wow. For, three for sessions. a whole day. For the whole day, for three on the whole day. I think, that, you know, I don't know what the check was, but I mean, listen, I am honest to goodness. You know, I'm not a special little person. I'm not. What I do is I work hard and I try and be positive and nice. And, and you're not a jerk. Right, I'm not <laughs> a, I'm a, I'm a jerk. Hey Vinny, don't be a jerk. Uh, but but it's been but it's definitely been a, a you know a kind of a journey. And 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 again, I, I just credit the the hard work that I put in to um, feel better about myself physically, mm -hmm. which made it a lot easier for me to feel better mentally, and then other people can kind of they can kind of read that. So I, I hope all of this has come off with the modicum of humility that I can muster. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying these things to, to toot my own horn, get it? Uh, <laughs> sorry, that was a total dad joke. When, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying these things to, to toot my own horn. And, and I, I will tell you this, are we, are we close to, are we close to finishing? Uh, I'll tell you two. Three things. <clears throat> corona was tough on everybody. Yeah. We were sort of set up for Corona for the virus. We didn't really know it because we've been doing remote or home recording for a long time. All of our studios are set up so we could socially distance. We could mask up and socially distance. So for 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 about two months there, you know, it was, but we after it started to relax a little bit, we were able to do the work. So that was really good. But uh, corona fatigue is real. It, it's real. We, we, have all, we have all collectively in our own ways. I used to say we're all rowing the same boat, but that's just not true. Because different people thrive in this. And some people want to be alone. Some people have a partner that they get. I was so lucky because Beth is working from home. I've never been more in love with anything in my life. Uh, anything than my wife. And, and this last year and a half has really solidified that for me. I already knew, but I mean, it's just like uh, the universe and God are patting me on the back and saying, you know, you're doing the right thing here. Keep, keep it up. And I, I can't figure out what I'm doing correct. So I'm just doing everything. And <laughs> some, of it, some of it sticks, but, but here is, um, you guys can hear that I'm a positive person, right? Slightly. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little bit about when I was 25 years old, I was diagnosed with syringe mealy. I have a syrinx, which is a um, cyst about the size of a pencil inside of my spinal cord. Ooh. What it did, I had an operation to stop the progress of the symptoms. And they went in, they took my vertebrae, the back of my vertebrae off, they popped a hole in it and put a shunt in it, basically a drain. If you took a magic marker and drew a line down straight down the middle of my body, Everything on the left side is feels like it's asleep. Always? Always. Since I was 25. Wow. 
So I want you to just, just chew on that and digest it a little bit. When I got out of the hospital, I couldn't walk because I couldn't feel where my heel was hitting the ground, and so I would fall. Chops and everything. Oh, no. Mm. So I've been, oh, wait a minute. I, Is that because it was pressing on the nerve before and then the pressure was gone? So it, no, no, it was pressing on the nerve. And want, it's seen now, if you cut your finger off, white nerve, and they put it back on in five years, you'll have finger, you'll have feeling in your fingertip because they grow back. Brain and spinal cord doesn't grow back. Once it's damaged, it's damaged forever. So this, this syrinx, about that long, you know, right there in my neck, put pressure on that left side and, and destroy the nerves. So, you know, when I get really tired, like this part of my face, it's just, it's just, you know, and, and basically what it was is it started out on the back of my head and it felt like I was being shot with a battery. And then within two weeks, I, I had no feeling. So I play at a reasonably high level um, and, and it's absolutely a miracle. And the fact that I can get on a bicycle or walk or do anything like, like you can't see this, but me being able to hold this in my hand has taken so much focus and so much practice because right now it's on the verge of cramping up because I can't tell how much pressure I'm using on that. So with trumpet, I can't feel how much pressure is on this side. And people say, how do you, how do you play? And I'm usually a smart ass and I say, well, very well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I want you to try and imagine what that's like. Um, and then Corona hits. And uh, what was that in March? Yeah. October um, 4th of last year, I lost my 29-year-old son in a car accident. Remember that. And then two months and a week, two months and two and a half months ago, my father passed away. So I'm telling you that not to be a Debbie Downer, although I can see on Jen's face, she's like, holy crap, this is coming off the rails, man. It was so good. No, uh, no, no, no. It's just like it's all a, that back to back. Oh, right. So, so I, I have done this entire interview before you knew that, and you would not have imagined that that kind of tragedy and that kind of crap had happened to this person. So it is all about maintaining mm -hmm. a positive outlook on life. Because I went to a neurologist at the beginning right before Corona. And I was really hopeful that, that because of the, the efforts that they made with spinal cord injury, that they were going to be able to fix this. And I went in and I told him my story. And I said, I'm, I'm really, really, really hopeful that you have some good news. This is after an MRI. And he, he looks up from his paperwork. He goes, oh, oh, no, you're never getting nothing back. And goes back to his paper. I mean, like, he just went, and just Way to be a jerk. Well, I, I, I chastised him. I said, dude, did you hear the story I just told you? Do you know what the last 30 years of my life have been like? And he's like, man, I got to be honest with you. I have to be honest with you. I don't have time to, to make you feel better about things. I'm sorry. He said, I just have to be honest. And I, I'm sitting there listening to this guy, just yeah. hating everything that's coming out of his face. And then something dawned on me and I said, well, I have one question. And he said, go ahead. I said, will it ever get any worse? And he said, absolutely not. Your syrinx is gone, it's drained. And so it will never put any more pressure on. And you will not get any worse for the rest of your life. And let me tell you what that did. That freed me from 30 years of bondage because yeah. I kept thinking every once in a while, I'd be like one day, uh, I used to think about Nick Bonacani because his son, you know, got, got his neck broken. And I think of Chris Reeves, you know, Christopher Reeves, the yeah. and, I, and I remember all the progress that I'm making. And now I don't have to think about that ever again. It's such a huge, I walked out of that office after that news and I was lifted up. I was walking six inches off the ground because I knew wasn't going to get any better, which is a super mm -hmm. big bummer, but it was never going to get any worse. And I've been living more than half of my life with this thing, and I'm kicking ass. 
<laughs> right? Right? It's okay to say. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, seriously, man. I mean, there there are people that want to be me. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, it's just, and, and again, man, you know, I, I, when I first started losing weight, I thought, what if this thing is just because I'm fat? That was a motivating oh, factor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was yeah. carrying, like I was putting pressure or whatever the deal was. But it's it's amazing what you can do. It's amazing what mm-hmm. you can do with a great attitude. And uh, yeah. now I fail every day. <laughs> but I feel like with regard to being a positive person, you don't have to be 100% positive all the time because that's just fake. I mean, because shit yeah. happens. I'm sorry. Yeah. Stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> You know, your son dies, and then your dad dies, and then COVID, and then you know this and that and the other thing, and all, and just it's just really, really crappy. Mm. But if you can get to fifty-one percent as a starting point, man, you are winning, winning, winning. Period. You're winning because you're. It's going to suck forty-nine percent of the time, but fifty-one percent of the time, man, you're going to find that silver lining, and everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. there you have it i think that's uh that's that's the best clip right the whole thing right there it, wow know. yeah <laughs> wow i could ask so many more questions i wanted more stories but you need to get in the pool so yeah <laughs> you need to get in the pool i don't want it to get too i don't want it to get too chilly you know it's at a perfect 80 yeah. degrees right now so i need to jump in excellent hmm. jen do you have anything to add before i you know, I, I, I really don't. I mean, um, everything you talked about today was stuff that people needed to hear or, and, or we've covered before, but you know, it's, it's different hearing it from somebody who's been in it, um, or dealing with it in one way or another, you know? So no, it's, this has been awesome. (laughs) I got nothing. Yeah. And if you guys have not gone and checked out Vinny's Instagram and his Facebook, where you're, you're ripping these, these high licks, just like they're nothing. Please go listen to this. It's just insane. I mean, <laughs> so it, uh, we will put the link to all your socials that you want to share in the show notes. Um, where can people find you, Vinny? Uh, well, I mean, usually hold up in my studio, trying not to suck. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I'm on Facebook at Trumpet Vinny, and and the thing, and and Instagram at Trumpet Vinny. My website is TrumpetVinny.com. Pretty easy. Very nice. Uh, but the thing is, is that like, if you don't, if you're not interested, I do these little blue screens, which are like logic captures, are like 15 seconds long, and I of course pick the coolest stuff that I think is cool. And, uh, but if you're not interested in, you know, trumpet and biking and pictures of dogs and hearing about how much I love my wife, I'm the wrong guy for you. <laughs> I'm the wrong guy. If you want to talk about politics or religion or anything controversial at all, I, uh, I dated a girl right after I got my divorce uh, in early 2000. And she said to me, and I'll never forget it, uh, refuse negativity. Never accept negativity. And if you tell people, hey, I'm not going to put up with that crap. And if you want to be like that, we're not going to be friends. Then you know what? It's just like the person that wouldn't hire you because you were fat. You don't want to be in that band anyway. You know, you don't. And you don't want to be with a person who is 51% negative. Mm-hmm. Most people don't get to that 51. They're more like the 80, 90, you know, and I want you to start sliding down that hill. So yeah, trumpetvinny.com uh, and, and uh, trumpetvinny on Facebook and Instagram. That sounds awesome. We will put all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for imparting your wisdom and your stories. That was so amazing. It's nice to hear that that part, that side of the, you know, we deal a lot with classical. It's nice to hear this other side of the entire music genre that we don't really hear much about. Yeah. The doubler in me was just like, yes, give me more stories. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Thank you again for joining us and we will uh, we will put all of this in the show notes. Y'all go check him out and thanks for joining us. Thanks y'all.